guys, welcome to a fabulous episode of the Boston Chris Podcast with yours truly, Boston Chris. And today's fabulous episode is brought to you by the Speakeasy Coffee House right there in downtown, beautiful downtown Quitman, Texas. Y'all make sure you're checking out the Speakeasy whenever you're in Quitman, Texas. They have fabulous drinks, um, pastry items, uh, live music, awesome, awesome stuff happening in downtown Quitman. So make sure you check them out. And this week on the show, we are proud to bring to you a, a good friend of mine and a Texas radio legend of 34 years in the radio business, the one and only Jim Nash is my guest here on the show today. And we talked to Jim about so many different things in his career, from uh, the military, uh, from growing up in Oklahoma, becoming a radio star. Um, and, and stuff like that. Of course, he was also a singer and in bands before getting into radio. We're going to talk about how he got into radio, how he became absolutely instrumental in the formation of Texas Red Dirt music that we all know and love today. A lot of that being able to be brought to you was created by Jim Nash. He's the one that started really openly playing this style of music on his radio show, um, which was called Honky Tonk Friday Night back in the day. Wichita Falls all started there. We're going to talk about the evolution of Texas Red Dirt music with the one and only Jim Nash, his new podcast, the fact that he's president of the Christian Music Association, the role God has played in his life and his experience, his family, and so much more about what makes the one and only Jim Nash tick. Guys, we're so excited to talk to Jim about everything he has going on. I hope you guys will enjoy this one. Make sure you like the the the, the episode everywhere you can. And let's get right into it with the one and only Jim Nash. Hi, I'm Cliff Doyle. Thanks for tuning in to Boston Chris Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to another fabulous episode of the Boston Chris Podcast. Guys, we have a huge treat this, uh, this week. Uh, we have... 34-year radio legend, my friend, Jim Nash, is on the show from the Texas Knockout. Um, how's it going, Jim? Going good, man. I don't know that I'd be throwing that word legend out there yet. I ain't done. Well, you ain't, <laughs> you don't have to you don't have to be done to be a legend, first of all. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. You're gracious. I appreciate that. Of course. So 34 years in the business, which means that Jim Nash has um, some perspective in especially the Texas red dirt scene um, that many people may not have. He was around before the advent of the Texas red dirt scene. I don't want to age you too badly, but I'm really looking That's forward okay. to I'm really looking forward to chatting about um, about the beginning and, and, and the evolution of, of that essentially an entire genre that you were instrumental in helping the creation of and I know you may not admit that, but from my perspective, I'm saying that as a fan of yours. Um, but before we get to the nuts and bolts of what makes Jim Nash tick, Jim, what are your favorite drinks right now? Just to break the ice. My favorite drinks? Yeah. Uh, cold metal or light and a bottle of water. Either or. <laughs> Just depends on if you're at work or not, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes it interchanges, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, you just have like, uh, well... The only bad thing is you can't put like that metal light in a water bottle unless the water bottle is not, you know, tra uh, transparent. Well, then that's when you switch over to the vodka. That's what I was going to say. That's where vodka has to be. It's funny. We just had Brandon Ryder on the show and he was talking about the evolution of his drink endorsements over the years where he, yeah. went, he went from whiskey to beer and now he's uh now now it's water he's he's endorsed <laughs> by water now i said well shoot i said brandon next up on the list is pedialyte i think right, <laughs> oh, yeah, right. They, get, they got that for adults now too <laughs> <laughs> exactly right oh we're gonna need it where we're going right <laughs> no doubt man so uh you grew up in oklahoma right Yep, uh, born and raised, yeah. So where at in Oklahoma did you grow up at? Uh, well, uh, part of my part of my childhood was in uh, actually in Oklahoma City. And then uh, when I was about 11 years old, I guess, my mom and dad moved, uh, moved a couple of city boys to the country. And, man, I didn't know diddly squat about living in the country, man. But uh, we quickly learned. You know, my dad uh, started running some cattle and, uh, I was thrown into the fire on that because, um, 
he still worked in Oklahoma City. So we we lived uh, just south of Norman in a little town called Lexington out in way out in the state, about 10 miles outside of town uh, by the two prisons that are out in Lexington. We lived four miles south of those two prisons. And that kind of freaked me out when we first got there. But uh, I was thrown right into the, the livestock thing, you know, and working the working the farm and the ranch and all that kind of stuff. So because he was still working there. So daytime things, milking the cows and all that stuff kind of fell on my brother and I, you know, we had, we had to learn how to do it. So that was, uh, that was where I moved there when I was about 11, 10 or 11 years old until I got out of high school. So learning that work ethic really, really young then, huh? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, it was something else. I'll tell you that <laughs> it was, but it was, you know, it was, it was something that that work ethic actually is that's, that's where I learned to, to work hard for what you get, you know? And, uh, I don't know. I don't expect anybody to give me anything because I've I've had to work for everything my whole life. So I kind of just went by that and learned that when I was a kid, you know. Yeah. And so, what were your musical influences like as you're you're growing up in that kind of uh, you know the the farming kind of um, life? Well, I tell you what, my my dad got me into the music business, or got me into loving music. Really, uh, he couldn't play a lick, couldn't sing a lick, but man we had we had one of the most badass music libraries you could ever have man i was like uh you know from stonewall jackson and marty robbins and johnny cash and all that old school stuff hank williams and then we kind of evolved into the waylon jennings and man when he brought waylon jennings and jerry jeff walker albums home man i was in love i was like man this is a cool sound because it's so raw and just uh it's so unabashed, you know, I mean, there's, these guys are just singing what they have, man. And I love that. And that's when I really fell in love with it. So it was, you know, it was, a, it was a lot of that, uh, uh Stonewall Jackson and Marty Robbins, Cash, Willie Whalen, Jerry Jeff, uh, Gary P. Nunn. Uh, of course, you know, he was with the Los Gonzos and, uh, it was, that was, that was kind of my, my kickstart of, of playing. And, I, and then I started kind of playing guitar and playing around in some jam sessions and playing in bands and stuff like that. And, um, so that's, that's kind of where I pointed my, my musical talent, which I didn't have much of that at all, but <laughs> what little I did have, I was pointing in that direction. <laughs> well, you tried it anyway, right? I was driving it, man. I was driving. So how did you get from that to the, to the radio stuff, you know, like, cause, uh, I mean, uh, typically, folks go directly into radio um I mean, a lot of times it's generational too isn't it yeah kind of um well you know i when i right out of high school uh i got married and and uh, had my son and then um we so i was in the army for three for three years and um and then once i got out of the army trying just to trying to find my way in life man because you know i was i was a an attack helicopter crew chief. There ain't a whole lot of bidding for that going on in no. this world. Nope. You know, so, uh, I mean, I could have went to flight school, but I really wanted to get back home to Oklahoma. And um, so I started dinging around with jam sessions and making money here and there. And I sold mobile homes for a little while and made a really good chunk of money off the State Fair of Oklahoma one year. So that kind of rode me out for a little while. And then finally my wife was like, this can't go on you've either got to pick us or the music so i quit playing music and then i just fell into a radio gig man i started going to broadcasting school and um i was going at night and then uh, i ran into a guy named uh charlie jones in uh, Lindsay, oklahoma god rest his soul man we, he was an awesome man and uh he got me my first uh, radio gig at uh kvlp there in Lindsay, oklahoma so that's so kind of yeah, just kind of really, I fell into it, man, because I was going to school, but I was spending more time at the radio station learning, and I can learn better just looking and watching and seeing things, man. I mean, I can pick it up real quick, better than I can book smarts, you know? Yeah. So um, it was really weird. I thought, you know, I, I'm learning more at the radio station. I think I'd be better off just saving this money that I'm spending on school and just, you know, try, it out, try my hand at it. Well, he didn't have a place for me. But the funny thing is, the good Lord stepped in about two days after I quit school. He called me that night and said, uh, hey, man, my seven to midnight guy stepped out or walked out on me. He goes, you want to try this gig? And I said, sure. I had never been on the radio in my life, man. I said, sure, I'll do it. <laughs> and 
I did, man. It's one of them things that you learn early on, right? Don't ever say no. Even if you can't no. do it, say yes. That, Always say that, yes. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I mean, I thought, how hard can it be, man? We're playing <laughs> records. We're playing CDs. I knew how to do that crap, you know? We had a little, we had a clock wheel on the wall. You know, you play this from this category, this from this category, your selection, you know? I mean, hell, I can do that blindfolded, <laughs> you know? <laughs> So let's talk about the military. You and I have a little bit in common. I also, so crew chief meant that you were taxiing air, the, the helicopters and things like that, right? Yeah, I was taking care of uh, three Cobra helicopters at one time. Yeah, I did a lot of that in, in the military as well. I wasn't a crew chief, but um, we taxied. I, I worked at a, a squadron called HM-14, which was minesweeping helicopters in the Navy. This was in oh, Norfolk, yeah. and so I did a lot of that um, flight line crew chief kind of work as well, taxiing and um, checking fluids and, and gearboxes oh, yeah. and all of that stuff. So, yeah. yeah, doing that was, and I got a lot of stick time too in the Cobras, man, because I had three really cool pilots, man. And every time we go flying, they taught me how to fly, man. I, I and I even I even tell my wife to this day I could I could jump into a Cobra helicopter do a flight check in that sucker jump in the seat and and take off in it I just remember that you know yeah I always thought it was cool like you'd have like commanders and lieutenants and things like that in the palm of your hands like you're just like this lowly like E2 and like they have to listen to (laughs) you and all of that stuff and like you could literally taxi them right into the freaking Atlantic Ocean if you want to yeah That is true, man. They have to trust you a lot. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. Uh, so, first radio gig is in Oklahoma. It's funny because here in the southwest United States, Oklahoma and Texas are kind of butting heads yeah. all the time, right? You never get along with each other. Um, and you've been in Texas for most of your career now. Um, do yeah. You, do you still get the, the Oki uh, um, oh. troll? Oh, man, there ain't a damn Longhorn joke or Oki joke, Oklahoma Sooner joke that I ain't ever heard, man. I swear to God I've heard them all. <laughs> and people still keep saying them, and I'm like, I'd have heard that 20 years ago, man. But, yeah, it, it, it was it was funny when I when I very first um, got to came to Texas. Um, I'd been in radio for, uh, well, from Lindsay, I went to Oklahoma City, and I was up there, and, and uh, then once that deal kind of fizzled out, and I was, I short. I call them I. It, I call them I short. But once they bought our radio station, they uh, they fired everybody one by one, and I lasted 13 months. But when I came to Texas, I was kind of leery because I thought, man, all I have is OU t-shirts. I don't have any other kind of t- t-shirts and stuff, you know. But I started wearing them, and people started giving me hell about it. But I didn't care, you know. Mm-hmm. And we had fun with it, you know. I, I I learned to have fun with it. I'm not vicious with the. The OU Texas thing or nothing at all, man. I sit and watch. I sit and watch that game with a uh, hundred OU or Texas fans and three of us Sooner fans, and that's it. We just had fun, you know. And and uh, but yeah, I, I catch hell all the time. My boss, man, he's he's a Longhorn fan, and I told him I was going home this weekend because we're going to a OU Texas uh, party. And uh, he was like, oh, man, he goes, I thought I was going to be able to give you hell this weekend. I said, nope, you can wait till Monday. <laughs> yep. Yeah, because if you guys, you guys may not know this, but we record this show in advance, obviously. But um, OU Texas is happening literally two days from today. So, like, yeah. um, everything, yep. uh, the, the whole state shuts down for that, I feel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, no doubt. Um, so we talked about um, off air a little bit the advent of red dirt music, and um, so when you started, we're talking thirty four years ago. We're let's say nineteen ninety, right, somewhere in there. That that's really uh, the format had to have been like nineties country, right, like the Clint Black and the Garth Brooks and all of that stuff from that era, right? Yeah, that was. Uh, it was really, you know, I mean, I was having fun with the nineties country man because it was good, and and I loved it. Until they started pulling in that bro country crap, man. And that's when I really started digging and going, man, there's got to be some other kind of country music out there. And then, so I decided that uh, I was at KLUR in Wichita Falls. And I, I came up with an idea because I had a database. J.B. Cloud uh, was going to start doing a show out in Abilene. And so he shared his database with me. We worked in the same company, so he shared his database with me. And I started going through there, and I hadn't heard most of these names. There's a lot of those names in there I had never heard before. But I started listening to music, and I'm like, man, I dig this. There's a market for this. So 
I came up with the idea to have a show called Honky Tonk Friday Nights on Friday night from, I wanted to do it seven to midnight, but they wouldn't let me do it at first. So uh, I had to beg the Dickie boys from Cumulus, man. Literally, they came to town and I begged them. I said, let me try this. And they said, it'll never work. It'll never work. I said, I tell you what, let me program this show. Give me two hours. Give me seven to nine on Friday night. Because all the other radio stations had their own programming and stuff. And they said, okay, we'll let you do that. I'm like, all right, well, good. Uh, so you can do seven to, minute, seven to nine. I said, all right, cool. So they said, you start on this date. That date just happened to be the very first day of high school football in of Texas. Of course. Absolutely. Why not? And every radio station in Wichita Falls had football on except our station. We were the only station that didn't. So I was I was perfect. I went, man, this is not good. This is going to crater, man. This will never work. So I rocked along there through the whole fall book. And when the ratings came out, it came out and said I had a 25 share from seven to nine. And I was blown away. I'm like, man, that means 25% of the market in Wichita Falls in the vicinity area was listening to me on Friday night. And you're playing Texas so, and Oklahoma music, right? Yeah, to playing Texas Red Dirt music, man. And uh, so after that book came out, then the Dickey guys came to town and they were like, this is unbelievable. There's got to be some kind of glitch or something wrong with the book or something like that. I said, I thought the same thing, but I'm going to take it for what they say. <laughs> so they said, well, we are too. So uh, you can go ahead and do, you can do seven to midnight then. I'm like, right on. I was already, I was doing afternoon drive anyways. I was number one in the market in Wichita Falls on in afternoon drive. So then they, they said, well, what you can do is you can voice track your last two hours and then, uh, or from 5.30 on, and then go get you something to eat and then come back at 7 to midnight. I go, okay, cool. So I did that. Uh, no boost in salary or nothing like that. I just did it because I wanted to do it, you know? So that's that's kind of that's kind of how I got it started, you know? And just so prior to that, fun. prior to that, how often was this style of music being played on air, do you think, around around Texas and Oklahoma? Not much. Um no, I mean, I, we had at KLUR, they had, we had a, a music library of records that dated back to the 40s, man. I mean, this guy had the the records in that radio station insured for like $7 million or something like that. I mean, it's a lot of music. So we could, and we, but we played some Jerry Jeff Walker every now and then, you know, and we played some of that older stuff, you know, and, and it was cool, you know, Guy Clark and uh, and cats like that, Rusty Weir and stuff like that that, that had been out for a while. Uh, we got we did play some of that, but as, as far as being it on a on a regular basis, there was nobody in Texas doing that. Like I said, JB Clad was about to start his uh, Honky Tonk Saturday Night show up uh, there, West Texas Saturday Night, I guess. So yeah, it's basically us. And so once you started doing that Honky Tonk Friday night thing, do, do you see kind of a snowball effect now with other um, other stations, um, you know, doing the same thing, trying to get their piece of that 25 share in their local demographics? Oh, yeah. It's, you know, it's it's gotten so, it's gotten to the point now to where there's more there's almost just as many texas red dirt stations as there are mainstream stations these days um and you know what i what really called me to the end in wichita falls was when you know pat green had had went to nashville and he had some uh, national releases jack ingram had some national releases and charlie robinson did too daryl dodd as well wanting, huh daryl dodd as well and, and... daryl dodd oh yeah he's he had a couple there but my main thing was, is I wanted to, those ones that were being pushed nationally, I wanted to get those into the regular rotation of the radio station. Right, right. And they were like, well, no, that's Texas music. That's what you play on Friday night. I said, yeah, but these are being pushed nationally by national reps. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. we should we should play that. It'll give it more exposure. No, they didn't want to do that. And man, I banged my head against the wall for six or eight months with those guys about that, man. And it, finally it just... I just broke, and I said, all right, I'm out of here. <laughs> so they were essentially treating it like a gimmick, and you're treating it more like a, you know, this should be more of a um, a, a mainstay kind of thing. 
and they yeah. were just wanting to keep the gimmick kind of closed right. off from the rest of it, right? Yeah, and, and the thing is, it's like, okay, you can look back over the history of country music, and I have. It goes in about a seven-year cycle. It go, it'll go traditional country for about seven years. It'll go pop country for about seven years. Then it'll go like uh, some kind of, you know, other kind of country for a while. And then it'll kind of turn into the outlaw thing. It'll be pretty good for a while. And then it goes back to traditional country. And that it has done that traditionally for a hundred years. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I could see when they started out with this bro country stuff, man, and it was like the rascal flats and cats like that. I was going, that ain't country, man. That just ain't country. And I, I, in fact, I had the guys on uh, from rascal flats on stage one night. I was about to intro them and <laughs> we were standing in the little green room and, uh, and the guys were like, uh, Hey man, what's, uh, what's hot in Texas right now? And I was like, well, you need to tell you what's in, what's hot in Texas. They said, yeah. And, uh, I said, well, let's see, uh, Pat green, Corey Morrow, Roger Craiger, Jason Bowden, the Stragglers, Cross Canadian Ragweed. And they were like, never heard of them. I'm like, mm -hmm. you guys need to get on the train, man, because this train's leaving the station right now. Mm -hmm. And that's, so, my, yeah, was, that's why I'm excited to have you on, because, like, literally that station had nobody at it until Jim Nash showed up at that station. And I love that. <laughs> and here, man. I, I mean, it's true, though. I mean, you're the precursor to this. Like, you... You're the one that kind of stuck your neck out for, for this style of music. And, um, yeah. I mean, you can literally date this back and you can see you're starting this gimmick. I put that in air quotes. And then after that starts, you can see all of these other stations across the state picking up the gimmick, so to speak, and start playing Oklahoma and Texas Red Dirt music. The beginning, right. the, the genesis to that was your Honky Tonk Friday night. So... Like, you need to take credit for that, man. You were a big part of this. Well, one of these days when they write the, when they write the history book, that would be nice, you know. And I, and, I, and I do. I see what you're saying. But, yeah, that's, that's, that's true, you know. I mean, there was nobody else playing this stuff and, and really being the, the flag bearer for it, you know, on radio. Yeah. Um, I could see, I could see the, these shows, especially around the colleges, for Pat Green and Corey Morrow and all those guys like that and Craiger, they were all big around the colleges, man. I could see in these college towns, I'm thinking, man, they need a Texas Red Dar solid station that plays that stuff. But back then, you got to think, back then, there wasn't the, we didn't have the catalog of music that we have now. Right. Um, without it being redundant and, and having, you know, repeating the same artist every couple hours or so, you know. And I want people to know out there, I'm not saying that these artists didn't exist, that there wasn't a music scene here, because it was here. It just yeah. wasn't it just wasn't bleeding into radio um right. at all. And it was like you know, this this even predates my time in Texas. I've been here since two thousand one. So I've always been privy to the way Texas music is. Now, obviously, it's evolved over the last 23 years since I've been here, and it's more now. Like, there's more award shows and more internet stations, and the saturation yeah. has definitely reached a pinnacle that didn't exist, you know, 20 years ago. Um, but that all exists partly because of Jim Nash. I mean, honestly. Yeah, it's, it, it is, it's really neat to say to be driving down the road, you know, with your radio on. And I, and I don't, I don't even have a subscription to satellite radio, which is out there, you know, but I just don't because I'm a terrestrial radio guy. And, but it's nice when you're driving somewhere and you run out of range of a radio station and you go searching for something. And you're like, Oh shit, there's Pat green, man. Right on. So you listen to that station until it's out of, out of, it's nice, you know, to now be able to do that instead of always having to, uh, play something off my phone or something like that, which that's, Lord knows that's the, the direction we're headed now, so... <laughs> it is. And I, I think it's also pretty cool now, too, like, uh, for somebody who's somewhat in the radio business, I'm really not, but, like, um, kind of the uh, um, the nephew, I guess, the podcasting, internet, whatever you want to call it. Right, um, yeah. But, like, I see so many of my guests now from outside the region 
that are trying to knock on the door. Like, they're trying to get into Texas instead of out yeah. of Texas. It never used to be that way, man. Like you said, like, Pat Green and all of these guys, they're trying to get noticed in Nashville back in the day. We don't need Nashville anymore. Like, we're completely no. self-sufficient here now. And, Absolutely. And, and now and people... I see so many people that are trying to take up residence in Texas just so that they can play their music on the radio here now. Yeah, yeah, that 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 happens quite a bit. In fact, it, I've got, I'm I'm not kidding you. I probably get ten or fifteen uh, new names in every single week in email, and I've never heard of them. And I will give I'll give them a shot if the music is good and it's country. I'll give them a shot. But you know the thing is, it's like. There are so many of, the, of them that are blending in, though. I mean, you get got a guy like David Adam Burns. Man, that boy's country as y'all get out. Mm -hmm. He's from Arkansas. Yep. Hey, we'll take him down here if he's playing country music, man. Hell yeah, we'll take you. But a lot of these people that are, they they can't make their way in Nashville on the independent scene in Nashville. So they think, oh, well, we'll just, we'll just go down to Texas down there. They'll take us in. No, well, a lot of them will. I won't. It's you a know? little harder, though. Yeah, it's a little yeah. harder than that. Yeah, gotta have you gotta have good music, man. If not, I mean, it can't be some hokey crap. You know, you're trying to get played on radio. I was like, no, man, come on, that's elementary. Hell, I could have wrote that. So, how do you feel about kind of the blending of genres in Texas now? Because that's happening quite a bit within our scene now as well. You've got some pop elements coming in to the red dirt and some southern rock and. It's not purely country anymore. Now we have that kind of same diversity in Texas. Um, so as a radio guy, um, do you do you still pull that stuff in as well? The the diversification. Yes, I mean you have to, to to program a radio station because I mean you're you're you ain't programming a radio station for yourself, right? And for what exactly all I like, you know, I'm programming a radio station for hundreds of thousands of people and you have to have that diversity in there because if not you start you, your station starts having a sameness sound and but you're right about a lot of that the pop sound and stuff with a lot of these guys there's if i hear a click track in the first 15 seconds of a song it's gone i don't give a damn who recorded it i am not even kidding I've, th I've thrown more, and I get promoters telling me, he's like, well, why won't you play this? I said, because it's got a click track in the front of it, and I ain't playing it. And it's that same, that you can hear it throughout. It's like that mechanical, uh, electronic sound to it. And I'm like, no, I don't, uh, you know. But uh, you have to be picky with what you play, you know I mean? I love Co Wetzel to death. There's only one song of his that I could even put in the system and play. Mm -hmm. You know, but... Um, they, I mean, even guys like Parker McCollum, and I love him to death too. And most of his stuff, we play most of it. And in fact, I, all of it really. But there was one song that he put out here not long ago, and it didn't do worth the crap for him here in Texas. And he was trying to get noticed in Nashville, but um, and it it did pretty well for him nationally, you know. So that kind of got him some national attention. And that's that's the younger generation, I guess. That those the kids love hearing that stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. Us old farts, man, we could. Uh, you get me some steel guitars and fiddles, man. I'm in. I'm right there with you in some mandolin. I feel you. Hell yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm there. I'm there with you. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I, I love that because, again, there's, there is a lot of diversification within the genre. You mentioned Co and Parker and... Um, you know, there's uh, on the other end of that, you've still got people like Robert Earl Keane and, um, you know, the Great Divide and all of the uh, Brandon Ryder is another one that comes to mind that are yeah. still making amazing, amazing red dirt music that is devoid of, of um, a lot of those uh, modern. I, I guess you could call them modern influences. I don't know. Yeah, I call them the kids. Yeah. It's them kids, man. Yep. I'm so, that grumpy old man that's standing out on the front lawn telling my kids get off my lawn, man. That's, <laughs> so one thing I definitely wanted to talk to uh, with you for folks that may not know how a radio station works, there is a certain hier hierarchy um, in, in the radio station. A lot of you guys and girls that are in the radio business have to pull multiple hats when you're um, when you're in radio, whether it's on air, whether it's behind the scenes, whether it's selling ads, like you guys have a lot more to do other than just be on the air. And I want to give you guys your flowers for that. 
Uh, tell us how the kind of the hierarchy of a radio station works, the different titles and the different roles that you guys have to pull um, yeah. as as a as an employee. As as an employee, I mean, generally you have like most of the time you don't have the station owner in the station. There are some stations that do have the station owner there every day. Um, and then you've got like, uh, from there, you've got like an operations manager. He's the below the, uh, below the owner. He kind of oversees sales and programming. And then, uh, you know, on the programming side, you're, or you've got a sales manager, of course, and sales folks Then on the programming side, you, then you've got a program director. He does all the programming for the radio station, all the, the sweepers and the liners and writes out the liners and everything that goes on and coaches the the DJs and all that kind of stuff. And then you've got, you know, a production director. One of the guys like, like, you know, if I, if I and I pulled it before, but where I was a uh, morning show co-host and production director, you know, I was in charge of all of the commercials that came in to get recorded, downloaded, put in the system. If I had to get another voice, I'd find somebody else to voice it and, and do that, you know, and then, I mean, there's a lot of, and then of course, you know, over the years, I watched every time we would have a problem at the radio station. I I was right up the rear end of the engineer, man, because I wanted to know how that st- stuff works, just in case one of these days I might need mm-hmm. it. And lo and behold, I did need it all. <laughs> but yeah, the, the hierarchy. I mean, you. But see, you know, like normally, like in a station our size in a small market, you don't have as many hats. I mean, you don't have as many people. That, but all the people there are wearing multiple hats, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, like with here, since we just fired this station back up in May, it's just me and the owner. He takes care of sales, and I take care of everything on the programming side. Um, and right now, it's 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 pretty easy. But you know, as as we progress and this station grows, then then we're gonna, of course, you know, have to hire salespeople and stuff like that. But um, once it gets too overwhelming for him. Um, yeah, he'll have to hire some salespeople. So, yeah, there's the we, you normally do. Everybody in the radio station. I mean, there's when I was in uh, in Waco, even we had salespeople that had air shifts. You know, they would go out and sell, and then they come in and do a, like a two hour sports talk show, go back out and sell. You yep. know, and um, it it to, in my opinion, it it works better when you've got a fewer amount of people. Um. And everybody can kind of work together, you know, and and just make sure it all gets done. You know, that's the name of the game right there. Just make sure the work gets done. And what's the turnover rate typically? Because I I know some stations that will have the same five or six people for decades. But then I've seen other radio stations that will go through people like water. So, like, how does that typically work? Well, a lot of times that, you know, for the on-air people and stuff, you know, as us radio uh, on-air people are we're creative people and when 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 our creativity is squelched um we start looking um Mm. i don't want i've never i've never had fun at a place where i couldn't be creative um and when i've always said that this job it ain't a job really because i get to go to work and have fun and play music every day Mm. but on the other hand when it becomes a job then it ain't fun no more. I gotta go. I gotta go find me something else that's gonna be fun and enjoyable to do. You know. And so, from a place of creation, how do you avoid that complacency, especially when you're on the radio four or five times a week for years and years uh, and years? How do you keep it fresh? Um. Well, you know, you have your normal benchmarks that you do every day, but thank God that that. See, I do. I have to do. There's so much weird news in the world. I do two segments of weird news in my morning show. Yeah. Thank God for those idiots out there. I wouldn't have a bit to do. <laughs> yep. you know? I mean, the world keeps the cup full, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, it does, man. I can get real creative with a lot of this crap these people do, man. It, it, that makes it easy. I mean, when I got ignorant people out there doing stupid stuff, I can talk about that all day long. <laughs> I, I have another podcast with Katie Lynn um, from America's Got Talent fame, and 
Um, yeah. When we started, um, I was like, we're going to focus mostly on music news, but like, if there's something controversial that pops up that we want to talk about, we'll talk about that too. And she was like, well, if we do this every week, how are we going to have enough to talk about? I said, oh, you ain't paying attention, sweetheart. You just <laughs> wait. There's going to be plenty. Oh there's my plenty God. in the world to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> so, this world um, gives you ammo. It gives you ammo every day. <laughs> yeah, and it's funny because, like, a lot of times the news will hit us with things on Friday or Saturday. We record on Mondays. So, like, uh, our outline will be completely empty all week long until the weekend. And then the weekend hits and our entire topic outline will get filled within hours. And she's just in awe because she's expecting yeah. us to have nothing to talk about every single week. <laughs> oh, we always find something to talk about. So one of the coolest parts of our job um, is the people we get to talk to, right? Like the people that come visit us and we get to chat with them and talk about their creativeness and their artistry and all of that. And so with 34 years, I can't imagine some of the folks that you have met over the time of being in radio. So I would love for you to share a couple of your favorite experiences when it comes to folks that you have gotten to talk to um, in, a business, um, in a business way, on the air or whatever. Um, you know, I, I have, I, a few years ago, I was asked that question and I honestly answered it. I've met, I met everybody in the music business at one point or another. I've done a show with just damn near everybody in the business, except some of these new guys, you know, the Kane Browns and all them. I wouldn't even care to do that, but the, some of my some you might be able to help find his way off his property if you, you know what I mean? You might be able to uh, help yeah, him. And I, yeah, and I ain't going hunting for him either. Uh, he, he can stay out there as far as I'm concerned. Um, but, I mean, I tell you what, there's there's so many stories, and that's kind of why I started my podcast was just to start telling stories. Because I had forgot a bunch of this stuff. And my wife had been on my ass for two years. Start a podcast. Start you know, cataloging this stuff so you don't forget it for life. And I go, no. But it was the weirdest thing because once I just hit that record button, man, memory started flooding back to me, man. It was just amazing. One of the coolest things that I got to do um, that I that I think was cool, we did a promotion in Oklahoma City when I was there. I was real new to the business. And uh, uh, we, did a, we did a thing around Thanksgiving, uh, into Christmas and it was uh what what we would do is is uh our program director by the way his name was Eric Logan he went on to be the president of country programming for XM Sirius mm -hmm. um and he was our he was our program director at the time so he backed this they got this trailer and they backed this empty uh 40 foot trailer uh big big semi trailer into the parking lot it was empty so we went on the air one morning at 6 a.m. and we all commenced to staying up until that truck was was full of toys. We had artists and stuff come by in the middle of the night, man. This is back in the day when Toby Keith was just starting out. He was playing at Chastain's Bar right down the street. So his guys would they would always load up their stuff, you know. And I knew Toby before I was even in radio because being around the music scene there in Oklahoma City. At the bars and stuff, you know, I'd see them all, see him all the time, and he stole our bass player from our band. So Chuck Goff went to go play with him, and God rest Chuck. So man, he was an awesome dude too. But they, uh, we we stayed up. These guys would go out and play their gigs, then they'd go eat at the at the uh, at the Waffle House or wherever they was going to eat at, and then they'd go to Walmart and they'd get a big old armload of toys a piece, and they'd bring them toys out to the trailer in the middle of the night. Um. So Toby Keith and his guys did that. Garth did it a couple of times. Uh, Reba, Vince Gill, um, Brian White back in the day, Wade Hayes back in the day. Um, all the all the Oki guys did that around there, and that was that was a lot of fun. And um, that getting those guys on the air in the middle of the night is funny because a lot of the listeners are going, "Wow, those guys really do stay up all night, don't they?" Yep, sure do. Yep. <laughs> but you know, I. I one of the one of the coolest things, the coolest people that I ever got to marry, um, uh, interview or meet, actually, um, I've never gotten tongue tied or or star started, you know, he's never starstruck or anything like that until I met Guy Clark. Wow! I was at Larry Joe Taylor's music festival and I was standing there with Tommy Alverson and Larry Joe and 
uh, Bruce Robinson walked up and I got, we got to talk with him. And, uh, I think Kelly Willis was standing there and my wife at the time, we were all just standing there shooting the breeze. His truck pulls up and, and, uh, Tommy goes, I think that's guy. I look down there and I'm like, Oh man, that is guy Clark. That is like, that's songwriting God over there, man. Mm-hmm. So guy come walking up on nonchalant to everybody, you know, they Tommy, I think it's, I think Tommy Alverson is the one that introduced me to him. And he said, uh, Hey, this is Jim Nash. He's from, uh, Wichita Falls. And, uh, I, I shook his hand. All I could say was nice to meet you, sir. And I was like, and I was just like dumb. And my, after he walked off, my wife walked off with me. She goes, nice to meet you, sir. Is all you could spit out to Guy Clark. And I go, I oh, know that's the first time that's ever happened, man. So I have a much worse story. Um, oh my gosh, Jim, you won't believe what I done, but okay. But so, all right. What so I did? got, I got to meet Charlie Robinson. Um, oh yeah. So he was doing a show in Lindale, um, when love and war was still here. It's something else now, but it was love and war in Lindale at the time. And so he was doing a show there and, um, I was, I was, uh, up there hanging out with, uh, fat Matt Gansel. If you remember him from KYKX in Longview, I don't know if you remember Matt, but no, I don't. But anyway, we were hanging out there, and I was going to get to do... This was like the grand opening of Love and War in Lindale. So I'm doing like a little promo video for them, and, um, you know, just with my phone and stuff. Um, and I got to meet Rick Lambert that day, Miranda's dad, and a bunch of other folks. And So long, long day. I was out there for like 14 hours, and um, Charlie was the headliner that night. And um, we got to talk with Charlie on his bus after the show, and... Charlie had been drinking as well as myself and everybody else. We'd all, yeah. all been drinking, and it was a long day. And I mispronounced Charlie Robinson's name directly to his face. Oh, did you throw an N in there when it wasn't supposed to be? No, I said Robeson instead of Robinson. Oh, okay. Well, at least you didn't throw an in in there, man. No, I didn't do Robinson, no. But he, so I said, so we're here with Charlie Robeson, or is it Robinson? And he said, really? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, no. Oh, my gosh. So, hey, I've yeah. Got a great, I've, I've got a great uh, Charlie Robinson story. You're going to love this one. So we got to, I got to go into go into these uh, these music trips down to Mexico. And I went to the, I went with the railhead crew. Uh, I went with them like three times. But this one in particular trip we were on, it was, uh, I think it was Charlie and Stoney, Randy Brown, um, hmm. and let's see who else. It, I, I think, I think Casey Donahue, Darren Kozelski, a bunch of them were down there. So the last night of the thing, at these mu- on these music trips, the last night everybody kind of dresses up a little bit. If you're in Mexico, dressing up is a nice shirt, some nice uh, shorts, and you know your flip flops, and a ball cap, cowboy hat, whatever. So, I was the MC for the whole week long. We'd been down there for five days, man, and it was this was the last night. So I get up there on stage. Everybody gets seated and everything, and we're up there shooting the breeze and talking. And and I hear a st- uh, Charlie was sitting. Uh, if, as you're facing the crowd, Charlie was on the on the right hand side, and Stony was on the far left hand side by the soundboard. So I'm kind of standing in the middle there talking to him, and, and they uh, and he goes, "Hey man, uh, Stony, Stony said what? He goes, "How many of them uh, Texas swim trunks that are there? They're over there in that guitar case." I didn't think nothing of it. Stony reached down there and picked him up and threw him threw him over to him. So I did my intro, intro to everybody, and started walking back to my table back there. About the time I stepped off the stage, everybody in the crowd is just dying laughing. First thing I'm doing, checking my zipper, make sure my zipper's up. Yep. I'm good, man. I'm like, what, I got a booger in my nose or what? I don't know. So I, they laughed all the way to the back there. And I got back to our table and they go, did you not see what Charlie did? I said, well, no, what did he do? They go, what did you do? And I said, well, he got those those swim trunks from Stoney. said, yeah, as soon as you introed him and stepped off that stage, he stepped off the back of that stage, dropped his drawers right there in front of God and everybody, and put them shorts on. He was <laughs> fuck ass naked right there in front of everybody. Let's I was go. like, no! I said, I'm glad I missed that. I don't want to see that. <laughs> well, that's a much so, better Charlie story than the one I got. <laughs> uh, after that, after that, man, I gave Charlie hell every time I saw him about that too, man. He, we laughed about that. Oh my God, that's I miss great. him. 
It was so funny, though. We got off the bus, and, like, I'm, I was pretty tight with Charlie's band. Like, I'd been talking with them the entire night, you know? Right. And, and, and his drummer's like, I think I think you're fine, boss. And I think he was just messing with you. I was like, it looked like he wanted to grab my soul out yeah. of my body. and <laughs> Just, like... <Yeah. laughs> He's got and he's got that sense of humor too. You don't know whether he's kidding you or not, man. Right. Like he was just deadpan. Really? Yeah, exactly. Really. <laughs> uh so I to this day I think he was kidding with me. I've seen, you know, I talked to him since then. He probably was. Yeah, and uh, he, he, you know, I've talked to him since then. He knew who I was. He remembered that night, and he never gave me shit for it. So, <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny because I'm a huge Charlie fan. I'm a huge Bruce fan. I know how to say their name. It was just I was so dang nervous that I had Charlie Robinson in front of me and, like, literally this close together in the aisle of his bus after, you know, he's sweating his ass off. He just put on the show of his life. I mean, right. I, I, I was a bit nervous, to say the least. So, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I, I told myself, I, I learned a big lesson that night. I told myself, no matter who I get to talk to in the future, I will never feel like a fangirl again. I will do everything I can to get all of that fangirl energy out of the way before I get to talk to them. That way... Right. You know, that way I don't make a fool out of myself again. And oh my gosh, man, I've lived by those uh, by that rule ever since. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's rough go right there, brother. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, God rest his soul, man. I miss Charlie as well. Um, what a what a great talent that guy was, unbelievable. And his brother too. Yeah. Holy crap! Like the two of them. Oh yeah, yeah. And Bruce and Bruce is tall. I think and Bruce is taller than Charlie was, and Charlie was like. Massively like a skyscraper, man. Both so I haven't met tall. Bruce yet. I'm a huge Bruce Robinson fan. Kelly oh, as he's well. Very, very nice man. He's a lot. He's a lot more, uh, a lot more gentler than uh, Charlie was. I can imagine it would. It would he's not near as gruff. <laughs> <laughs> he probably wouldn't be like really. No, <laughs> no, no, he wouldn't. He so would let's talk about him. family because I know family is really important to you as well. I, I've I've followed yeah. you on social media. We've been friends for a while. I don't believe we've ever met in real life. Um, I don't think we have either. But I know that we've been we've been friends forever. I mean, as long yeah. as I can remember. And so I, I know how important family is to you. Your son is an artist as well. Um, and, yeah. And credits you, obviously. I've read a lot about Jimmy. He credits you for his, for his uh, experience in music. I, I want to hear you talk about your boy and the rest of your family as well. All right. Um, well, my boy... Uh the first picture, one of the first pictures I can ever remember um, that with him and a guitar was when I, we were living in California and I was sitting on the on the couch and I was playing my guitar and Jimmy came over and he was little bitty. He was, I don't think he was even a year old. And he came over there and I gave him, the handed the pick to him and he started strumming the guitar. And uh, the more I was around music, the more <clears throat> he wanted to be. And I told him, I said, son, I'm going to tell you right now, I said, it's a hard road to be an artist, man. And he has my singing voice. I got, I, and he knows that, but he sings, he sings in his range. He knows where his range is at. He sings songs that he's comfortable with, and I, I love him for that. But he, uh, he done it pretty seriously there for a while. And, um, you know, of course, then he was married and had, uh, you know, he, he had, got granddaughters and all that kind of stuff now and he's got to have a real job like me you know so i don't even think mine's a real job but you know he's got to have a real job and he didn't now he just kind of piddles but man he's a um my son's a hell of a songwriter man he can he can write some really really stuff that just grabs your heart you know and 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 it's coming from his heart and i know that um i always tell everybody i got my heart from my mama and I got my, my sense of humor from my daddy. And so I think that my mama's heart uh, moved on down to my son too, because he's got a big heart and he, uh, a real sensitive heart too. And that's, that's kind of where his music, uh, goes, you know, but, um, I then I've got, uh, got a couple of daughters and another son. Uh, my son, Josh lives up in uh, Oklahoma and my daughter, Brittany lives in Oklahoma and my daughter, Kennedy lives in Oklahoma. And, um, so Jimmy and Jimmy and, the, and his family live in Ennis and that's kind of, you know, he, I get to see him whenever I can, you know, but he's been real patient, uh, with me and my career. As soon as he got out of high school, he moved to Wichita Falls with me. 
and was going to play baseball. Got involved in the red dirt music scene, and um, he 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 realizes that being in this kind of a job and career, there's stuff that fa with family you're going to miss. And you know what? The longer I've been in this, the more I'm going. I ain't missing that. I'm not going to miss that no more. There's technology now to where I can voice track a whole week's worth of shows and not even be there. But um, Jimmy's followed me just about everywhere I go. And once he got married in Ennis, he goes, well, I ain't moving to South Texas. I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> this is when the following <laughs> stops, Dad. I'm not following yeah. anymore. <laughs> yeah. So, And then, uh, you know, I married my wife, Kim, uh, four years ago. We just celebrated our four-year anniversary down in, uh, we got married in Lukenbach. Um, and it was funny because we were going to get married in March uh, in 2000. And then, lo and behold, if the damn pandemic didn't shut us down, man. And we were going to get married in Lukenbach anyway. So, they shut that down. So, a few months rocked along there and Thomas Michael Riley was going to have his music festival down there in Lukenbach and that just so happened to be the first date where Kim and I went on our first date wow. uh, in 2015. So we decided we were going to get married at Thomas Michael Riley's Music Festival. Uh, and it was uh, it, on June 6th. And by, that'll always be his his music trip will always be our anniversary weekend. And uh, he was just in studio with me a couple of weeks ago. And he said, man, and then I screwed up, and moved it up to May. And I said, I know, but it's still our music trip, our <laughs> anniversary trip. But. So y'all been together since 2015? Do what? Y'all have been together since 2015? Well, we were no, I we were to get we went on our went on a date and then I I ran off to Arlington and was dating somebody else for a while and um and then lo and behold her and I one one night I was doing uh, internet radio and I was doing a show with Jamie Richards at uh, at Hoots in uh, outside of in uh, outside of Burleson. And I come out of I come out of the bathroom and ran smack dab into her. That's the first time I'd seen her in uh, four years, five wow. yeah four years. And uh, we uh, we ran into each other literally face to face. And we were like, oh my gosh! Since that night, we we've, we've been together ever since. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. I I, I keep I always tell her I said that was a God thing. Yep. God meant for us to be back together, and He put me coming out of that bathroom and you going to the bathroom. <laughs> and I love, I, I, as 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 a friend of yours, I love your love story with her. It's so cool to see you guys just being normal on on social yeah. media. I love it, man. I, I truly do. Um, yeah, um, you, you just brought up God. Let's let's bring up God because God has not always been present in your experience. This is something that you. Um, it's not recent, but it's within uh, the last, what, 15, 20 years that God has really made a, a, a more of a presence within your life and your career and all right. of that. So what? The, tell us about the role of God in, in everything that you do nowadays as, a, as opposed to when you first started. Well, I was, I was raised in a Southern Baptist family. Um, I had uh, two uncles that were uh, my mother... Uh, two uncles that were Baptist preachers and my granddaddy was a uh, deacon in the Baptist church in Tennessee. And we went to church. Uh, I got baptized when I was like 17, I guess. And then, you know, I did, I did all my years of my rough and rowdy ways. Like everybody does seems to be. And, uh, you know, a backslid there for a long time. But, um, uh, I started, I started really kind of feeling the urge of God in about 26, 16 or so and so I started going to church again and then um, you know I started reading the Bible more and then I really had a, a really strong connection with God at that point well this is going to sound crazy but this is the story man I was going to work I was living in Arlington and working in Corsicana and I was driving from Arlington to Corsicana every morning Wow, it was a one hour drive and as I was driving down the road one day and I I always took that time, that hour, to spend my time talking to God and and praying, you know. And I was, we were rolling down the road, and I looked over. I was praying about something. I don't even remember what it was I was praying about. But I looked over, and I kid you not, Jesus was sitting in that passenger seat of my truck. Wow. And looked over at me, and he said, 
I was, I know what it was. I was wrestling with the idea of, of not being in radio and doing something else. And he looked over at me and he said, leave radio, my son, I will take care of you. And I was just as blown away as anybody else is whenever I tell him that story, but it's a true story. And so right then and there, I did some more praying for the next couple of days or so. And I just knew I had to leave radio. So I turned in my resignation and left the ranch. And uh, my last day was uh, October. I got to plug my phone in. Give me a second here. October 31st of uh, 2017. And that was my last uh, time at the ranch. Oh, no, why this thing is working? But the cool thing is, is the, um, you know, it, it, I thought, nah, man, I'm never going to be in radio again. And man, I had some hellacious great shows with KD before I did leave there. But, you know, we, um, uh, God is a big part of my life. Um, and I, and I'm a firm believer that if God tells you, he's going to take care of you, he's going to do something. God's going to provide for you. And, and on one more, uh, one or more of occasions, it has proven a fact with my wife and she, she's a believer now. <laughs> she knows because I've showed her and I've told her that, did you see what just happened? This happened. We were struggling. Boom. Money shows up in our bank account. How'd that happen? I'm going to tell you how that happened. Cause we were praying about it. So God is an important part of my important part of my life. I, I started posting a Jesus calling book, uh, a picture of the page every day. And it has Bible verses at the bottom of there. And I, I would post those. And then, uh, I finished that and then uh, did that for a couple of years. And then uh, another book that Sarah Young had written called uh, Jesus Always is what I'm posting now. So every morning when I get to the station, first thing I do is take my hat off. I sit here and I say a prayer and I read my Jesus Always and post that um, before I even unlock the computers and everything. It's just I sit here and in my quiet and it's uh, I, I I think there's there's the, there's a lot more of that now than the, than what there was uh, I'd say even five or six years ago. Um, I think God's really making a He's making headway with a lot of people, and it's really a an amazing, blessed thing to see Him working in people's lives these days. You know. Mm-hmm. And I was I was there when you uh, when you left the station. Uh, I was following you, and yeah. um, I remember you started up uh, what was a Nash Music Group. And yeah, um, I remember that you picked up uh, Tanner Sparks uh, because yeah. I was I was friends with Tanner at the time. We had already had Tanner on the podcast at that point, and then I think you and I set up an interview with Tanner to for his second appearance um, on, did, po- yes. on the podcast. But what I yeah. want to talk, uh, if if it's okay with you, I'd love to talk with you about uh, something I listened to you talk about on your podcast. And that was the frustration of um, kind of your circle distancing itself from you after you left radio. And uh, yeah. are, are you okay with talking about that? Yeah. Yeah, I'm fine with it. Because uh, I definitely noticed that myself. I, I stepped away from podcasting um, in 2019. I did it for a few years, 400-something episodes. I mean, we were busy. Um, and it felt really important in the scene. Uh, I'll keep it real. Like I felt important. And then I, I decided, you know what, this, this is just too much. I was doing four or five episodes a week. It was really kind of controlling my life. My family life was suffering. So, I, you know, I, I decided to step back from that and stopped it just cold Turkey. And then noticed that all of those people that, that were, you know, supporting me as a as a, a personality, internet radio, whatever you want to call it. All of a sudden, those people didn't need me anymore. And, and so, when you talked about that on your show, when you left radio, it really hit home to me because I experienced that myself. Yeah. Um, so, like now that you're back in radio, have you seen a kind of a a reversal of that? Yeah, you know, it's funny. Um... When I when I started the Gymnast Music Group and man, I mean, I was rocking along there. I had I had Tanner Sparks, I had Jerem Bell, I had uh, Caleb McIntyre, and man, all those dudes were. I was getting their songs up the charts, man. It was really cool. But like I said on my podcast, all of a sudden, all my buddies that I figured, man, these guys will play the songs because they used to call me for 
programming ideas and and I would help them, you know. I thought surely they'll play my music, you know. And a lot of them did. I will not I will say a lot of them did, but um <laughs> there was a lot of them that um that did real well with it. But then when I decided to start getting back into radio, that's when they decided that, well, he's double dipping, man. He's double dipping in the music business. But now I'm fixing to start doing it again. Cause man, there's other, there's other program directors out there in the world that are doing this the exact same thing and promoting music, man. I mean, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but that was, I think now it'll, it, I think it's, I think it's more acceptable now than what it was when I got out in 2017 because we have a lot more, we have a lot of younger program directors now. Um, a lot of them, I don't know a lot. Most of the, most of the same guys or the, the old, old regime are still around, you know, they're still there and, and I'm still real good friends with those people. But uh, a lot of these new program directors, man, they don't give a damn who a promoter has, who who's promoting this song. If they got a song, they're going to get that song and they're going to put it on the air regardless. Mm-hmm. They don't care. But I have seen, since I have got back full into programming, actually, uh, when I was in Wake, I was just sidekick and, and put the music in the system, but did a lot of other stuff, but I wasn't actually programming. Um, now that I'm actually programming again, uh, the promoters, the promoters tell me they're like, you can never leave programming again. We need you. This scene needed you back in this thing. And because I always have this reputation of I give the little guys a shot. Yep. You know, if the song don't do well and the listeners don't like it, I'll take it off the air. But I give the young guys a shot because I look at it this way. Who's going to fill their shoes? Mm-hmm. You got to have somebody to fill those shoes we don't need 517 new ones a week, but we got to have some folks that are going to fill the shoes of country music for years to come. Mm-hmm. And that's why I like to give the young guys a shot because they got to carry the torch at some point. But the program directors out there now, I'm getting back in with all the all the old boys that I all the good old boys that we used to all hang together. And we're all cool now, you know, but dare I get off back into programming and doing record promotion we'll wait and see how that deal rolls out i don't know it's eye-opening though isn't it it is it is yeah it's uh like i said on my podcast it was it was funny because all the guys that i thought were my buddies and they'll play this music all of a sudden they ain't my buddies they're still my friends but they ain't my buddies like we were when we were in radio Mm -hmm. you know it's those guys are old school i get it i totally get it i'm the same way i'm the same way man i'm i'm old school and and I see where they're coming from. Uh, I really do. But they also got to remember, and they all know this too. Radio pay sucks. Mm-hmm. You got to do something <laughs> in this economy. We got to do something. So one thing I did want to talk to you about, because again, this is something that came from me listening to your podcast, is the rules of um, transitionary things on the radio. In other words, no back-to-back females. None of this, yeah. none of that. Up tempo followed by a slow song. That never have two slow songs in a row. All of this stuff, um, yeah. and, and that was very eye opening to me as well. Now I've never been involved in programming. I, I've I've been friends with and really close friends with programming directors and things. So I do kind of know how it works. Um, but where I'm headed with this is the female artist who I feel like is really really unheralded in the world of radio. And I feel like a female, in order for them to get noticed in radio, has to be, like, the best of the best. Whereas, like, a male artist has no trouble getting on the radio, even with, you know, not being as good as some of the girls. What can females in the industry do to get more, more? I don't want to say more notice from radio, but just to, to be played more on radio? What can they do differently? Well... It's gotten easier in the last two or three years because we're getting a good influx of female artists. Um, <clears throat> I will say some of the some of the females, um, they have that uh, they went to vocal school or pageant school or whatever. You can always tell because when you're watching them play live, they'll go to the left side of the stage and they'll sing there for a minute. And then they'll march over to the right side of the stage as they're singing for a minute. And then they'll move back to the middle. 
it's just that it, it it happens. I know this and I've seen it. But the thing is, the girls are doing very well right now. They're uh, they're putting out some music that that that's perking some ears up, and that's that's what it takes, really. You gotta you gotta stand out, you know. Um, the world's already got a Miranda Lambert. The world's already got a Reba. We don't need another Miranda. We don't need another Reba. But they're 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 being themselves a lot of them now, and I and I really dig that. And I think you look at somebody like Brie Bagwell. Bless her heart. That girl didn't get voted artist of the decade for no reason. Mm. She's been pounding the pavement for years. But she's always true to herself. She writes songs that are true to her. And I think that's what the females have to do too. But, uh, you know, so many, so many people want to hear female, the softer singing females, kick it up a notch, have some up tempo stuff, man. Kelly Willis never did. Mm -hmm. I mean, Kelly Willis is one of the, has one of the most beautiful voices I've ever heard. She didn't have a bunch of that rock stuff and all that crap behind her back. You know, I mean, I think the females are doing what they, more of them now are, are being themselves and that's what they got to do. You just got to be yourself. That's the thing about the Texas music. Be yourself. You know, yeah. you can write songs about if you're, if you literally grew up sitting out in the country on your tailgate, listening to the radio, drinking cold beer with your buddies, that's believable. Now, if some Nashville cat that comes from New York sings that to me, that ain't believable to me, you know, but the songs have to be believable and the girls are doing a really good job right now of marketing themselves and with themselves together too. And that's, that does a lot of, a lot of good too, you know, because, um, you know how it is and chicks stick together, man. So yeah. They, it's definitely gotten better. Um, since, since yeah. I started interviewing in 2016, it's definitely gotten better. You see, you see more, um, women artists on the charts, which means they're being played more and that's good. Yeah. I just, I, I yeah. just wish they had more of a, an equal chance, um, because there are a lot of unique uh, female artists in Texas that don't get any love whatsoever from radio. And it's funny you, you talk about, you know, don't be a clone. We already have a Reba. We already have a, a Miranda. I mean, I yeah. would I would flip that uh, to look at males. We don't need more George Strait clones. And there's dozens oh. of them on the radio in Texas. Oh, so yeah. I feel, I feel like true. the males don't have to be as unique as females to get noticed. And that's unfair to me, I feel. No, but you know what I've always said? It's all about the song. I agree. I agree. I've preached that for years. It's all about the song, man. I don't care what you look like. You can, hell, you get a guy like Jamie Richards. That dude has written. He's got a catalog. He's got a, a about a foot thick notebook of songs he's written that he's never recorded. Yeah, I love Jamie Richards. And, and man, he is like I call him Mr. Country Music. He's our modern day Merle Haggard, man. I mean, but guys like that. He could show up in a T-shirt and his tennis shoes, which I've seen him do that. And nobody would know. And just sit down and sing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's all about the song, man, and how you present your song to me. Agreed. And, and females, the females are doing that just as well. I don't care if they're male or female. If if they sing me, if, if they send me a good song, or if they sit in the studio and sing me a good song, I'm going to tell them that's a good song. I'll play that. Yeah. I don't care. And you are, that's why, like, I wanted to ask you that, because you are one of the few that I feel um, in the industry that is a champion of female artists. Um, and yeah. So definitely wanted to get you um, on the record talking about that, because... Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think, I, I think that, I mean, because, God, who wants to listen to a radio station all day long of nothing but dudes, you know? I mean... Not me, you got that's it. for sure. But like right. it, it was really eye opening to me though to hear you say that you weren't allowed to play back to back girls. And well, that was because back in those days when I was taught uh, programming and stuff like that by Eric Logan and Dave Dodson and those guys like that, Mike Crow, we uh, that was the that's the old school way because there weren't that many females, and you didn't want to burn up all of your all of your female songs because you wanted those sprinkled into the hour. You don't want them back to back, you know? So that was just kind of the general rule back in the 90s, man. It's like you just didn't play two females back to back. And then and the old school 
rules of no, no, you know, no two slow songs back to back, and which I can understand that because God, I wouldn't yeah, yeah, listen yeah. to that. Well. <laughs> so those rules are obsolete now, then, right? So they don't exist anymore. Not really. No, I mean, uh, here at my station, I don't. I try not to play, but even though there's so many more females, I try not to play them back to back. I'll at least spread them out one or two songs, but just try not to play them back to back. But but I still do. So it, I mean, it really doesn't matter anymore, you know. Yeah, see, I, that would never work for me because I'd just be playing stuff that comes out of the cosmos. Like, a song will remind me of another song which will remind me of another song. And so the, <laughs> the programming would go out the window. That's why I would never, yeah. it would never work for me. Uh, see, Chris, that's why we have music schedulers. It does it for you, man. You don't have to do that. Yeah. You don't even have to think. You hit a button and it does Oh, shoot. I'd be canceling that shit, man. I'd be like, no, 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 no. We want to hear something different here. Oh man. oh, man. This is the greatest thing ever. Yeah. So a, a new role that you've taken on over the last couple of years is um, the Christian Music Association president. Um, yeah. I would love to hear you talk about this and how this came to be for you. Well, it came out of the blue. Uh, I was not even expecting it. I got a call one, or I got a text one morning while I was on the air in Waco from uh, Linda Wilson. She's the president of the uh, TCMA. So she said, call me whenever you get off the air. And I said, okay. So, you know, I've known, I've known Linda for years. And uh, when I called her, she said, now, this is going to sound really strange to you. And I said, hey, I'm a radio DJ. Nothing surprises me anymore. Now, you can't surprise me. She said, well, I might right here with this. And I said, all right, what you got? She said, um, you know, we have the, have the, the TCMA. I said, yeah. And she said, well, we also have uh, we have the Christian Music Association. We've really not done anything with it. We've got, you know, we've had a, a website and um, things like that. But she goes, I really want to I really want to grow that. And I think now is the time to do that. So I want you to be the president of the Christian Music Association. She says, I've. I've she said, God led me to this, and God led me to you to do this. And I said, oh, wow, okay. <laughs> I said, well, as I do with any other thing, I said, "I'm. can you allow me a few days to pray about it? She said, absolutely. So I prayed about it, talked to my wife, and made my wife the vice president. And my wife was like, does she really want me to be in the Christian Music Association? I'm like, my wife's redneck as they get, man. I said, <laughs> Man, honey, I don't know. I said, but maybe this might be good for you. <laughs> and I, said, I said, I don't know. I said, I'm gonna, I told her I was going to pray about it for a couple of days. So I did. I prayed about it. And I kept getting the prompting to, to do it. And so I called Linda and I said, all right, I want to do this. And, and I had no idea what I was doing. And still don't, to be honest with you. Um it's it's an undertaking that uh, is going to take. And I told Linda, I said, I will tell you this: if we we won't be able to grow this overnight. But I said we'll be able to grow this over a period of a couple of three years or so, something like that. And it's it's a neat deal because it's not just Christian country music; it's Christian music from right. all over the world. Yep. And there's a lot of the videos and a lot of the stuff that we get and put on the uh, the Facebook page that we have, uh, Christian Music uh, Association Inc. Uh, Facebook page. Um, I can't even understand the language. I don't even know what the language is, but I know it's it's Christian music. And as long as it's Christian music, you know, it's like I feel that I feel the need that we that we need that it needs to be on there, and it needs to be heard. And that's kind of what we do. We just we we try to find uh, not just Christian country music, but just Christian rock and Christian rap and Christian reggae. And I mean, man, there's so many different styles of Christian music. It would blow your mind. Blew mine. I had mm -hmm. no idea it was there. Was so many different uh, styles of Christian music. But it's uh, it's a it's a blessing to get to to see these people because we have to approve everybody all of them because there's so much spam out there in the world we have to approve every member that comes in and um every member that uh, wants to post a video or something like that we have to approve the videos first because 
you get spam crap all over all over the place all the time but um what what i'm wanting to do is to grow this into an association like uh like the texas country music association um and and have an award show later on and and stuff like that you know in all the different genres which would be unbelievably cool but um it's it's a slow process and you really have to uh you know being in radio and being kind of tied down to the radio station here it's kind of hard for me to get out and hear different kinds of christian music and stuff in different places so uh, we're in the process of doing that and trying to really get that uh, ramp up a uh, membership drive on the uh, uh, christian music uh, association.com and um you know get a membership drive going on that and try to start getting some perks and stuff like that for people that sign up with us yeah, and we'll definitely put something in the in the description below for that as well to get people who are interested uh, to funnel awesome. over there for y'all. Um, everything yeah. Linda does is is really amazing. Uh, I've been following her journey for a long time. I've known Linda a lot of years. I'm just so yeah. excited for her and all the things that she has going on, and it's such a benefit to so many people. And like you said, not just in Texas now with the TCMAs, but worldwide with things like Christian music and. And yeah. some, some other things that she has going on as well, including a Texas country music chart, um, which which w wasn't there until maybe five or six years ago. Right. And yeah. So, that's uh, and, and and man, I mean, I tell you what, <clears throat> I saw a video the other day of a guy that was doing Christian music with that with the reggae with the steel drums and all that. Dude, I was blown away. I'm like, now that is cool, man. That would make me listen. You know. Yep. Absolutely. Speaking of making people listen, hey, perfect segue. I love that. So Jim yeah. Nash is now into podcasting, um, which I am so excited about because this is my area of expertise. And to see you right. as kind of the newbie in my area of, of expertise yeah, now is yeah. so cool. And uh, you've helped me out a lot over the years without even knowing it. And now um, I get to help you a little bit here along the way, too, and, and uh, yeah. teaching you about RSS feeds and helped you out with your Twitch channel and things like that. It's just super, oh, such, yeah. a, such a cool thing for me um, to help you out, man. So thank you for that, first of all. But let's talk about the podcast, man. This is exciting stuff. Okay. Well, about two years ago, I, I, so all these years I've had, gosh, I've had so many just cool stories to tell and i've had multiple people tell me they're like you need to write a book and i'm like man i can't remember half the shit that i've done in my life i can't write a book so <clears throat> a couple years ago when the podcasts were really starting to you know kind of take off for a lot of people my wife uh, got to listening to some podcasts and she'd been on me and she said you know what you need to do a podcast and i'm like she said, you've got all the stuff in there in that room to do it. All you got to do is sit down and do it. You got a laptop. You got that little that little square box thing there that hooks up to that little board with all the knobs and stuff and a microphone. What else do you need? And I go, well, nothing really. I said, I don't know what I got to say. She said, my God, you've got five million stories. You've got a lot of stuff to say. Yep. And I said, I don't, nobody wants to hear that crap. She said, you'd be surprised. She said, people love hearing those kinds of stories. And I said, well, I got a bunch of them. So <clears throat> she rode my butt for about two years. So finally I got down here and, and uh, <clears throat> I was sitting around one day and I thought, I remember where we were at. We were, it might have been at the apartment. I was talking to Alan and we, we got to talking, telling stories and stuff. And he was like, man, you've got the coolest stories. And I said, yeah. I said, I know my wife tells me that. And she says, I need to do a podcast. And he goes, you got all the stuff down at the station. Do it. And he goes, do it. I said, all right. So I did. And I, you know, and I even told my wife, I'm like, I don't even know where to start. I don't know what my first episode needs to be and how long it needs to be or anything like that. <clears throat> she said, all you got to do is tell your stories, just tell stories. Yep. And, and so I've always said, you know, I've even said it on my podcast. I'll, I'll tell you the truth. The way it happened to me and the way it happened to others, I'll never lie to you. Tell you that, I will tell you the truth. So I sat down one day, and I said, I thought, well, no better place than at the front. So I started talking about my radio journey, you know, and uh, stuff for that. That was my first episode, and I'd just gotten fired from Wichita Falls and started 
or got gotten fired in Oklahoma City and started in Wichita Falls, and that was the first episode. And then I went from, you know, I did it from I told my told some stories and stuff, and even about how I started the Texas Red Dirt stuff in Wichita Falls and some of the stories with the guys, and um, you know, and all the way down to uh, Cleburne, then Fort Worth, and Corsicana, then internet radio for a little bit, and then Waco, and now here, and that kind of ended the second episode. But then after that, you're kind of thinking. Oh man, what am I going to talk about now? You know, so Carrie Dean, Carrie Dean, been on my mind. Carrie Dean, if for all the people out there that are listening, Carrie Dean and I were uh, radio partners uh, in Corsicana for about twelve years, and we uh, we won um, seven Air Personality of the Year awards in a row. Um, we were, I will say, we were badass, man. <laughs> we yep. were good. We were the best damn radio program in Texas. I promise you that. And I would put us up against most of them that are in the United States even. But Carrie Dean had been in my mind after I finished uh, episode two of the podcast. And I thought, you know what? I've got some of these old morning fiasco bits. I said, I'm going to get him on a Zoom call. And I said, we're going to record us a podcast. So I called him up and I said, hey, man. I said, uh. I need you to set aside some time tomorrow. And he said, what for? And I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm doing, I just started this podcast. So I want you to be my guest on the podcast. He goes, what are we going to talk about? And I said, what we used to do. And he goes, oh, hell yeah, we can do that. <laughs> so we did. We did. Uh, I put some of our old bits in there and, and uh, people just loved it, man. It was so cool. And then so after I did that one, then I was going, well, hell, what am I going to do now? So I decided by light, the the last one that I did was uh, called Shenanigans. It was just backstage stories with the artists and things that we did and fun times we had and just uh, surprised the law didn't get called on us times, you know. <laughs> well, it's a great it's a great concept. I, I mean, anything you're behind is going to be great anyway, but. Uh, it's a great concept for you personally because you have all of these stories that you've lived, but you also have the connections to bring damn near anybody you feel would be a good guest onto the show as well. Um, right. Like you could call literally anybody in the state and they're probably <laughs> going to do it for you. You know what I mean? Yeah. And in, in the story of the in shenanigans there, when I was telling the story about Steve Helms eating cookies and stuff, Tommy Iverson's family gathered. I did uh, afford Helms the luxury of texting him and making sure he's all right to put that story in there. <laughs> so, but other than that, all the rest of them, they were, they, I mean, they were as bad as Helms' story, but he's like, hell yeah, tell him. He goes, make sure you tell him that I ate two cookies. I said, oh, I did. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> it's just such a great idea. The, the show is called Behind the Mic with Nash, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's on all the streaming platforms that, I can find right now and trying to get them on more of them, but it's on the main ones that everybody listens to on Spotify, YouTube, uh, iTunes, Amazon Music, uh, Audible. Uh, yep. I mean, it's uh, it's on a bunch of them out there. So just like with everything else, I'm going to put that in the description down below as well. Guys, we're going to have Jim Nash linkage for days down there in the description <laughs> from his radio station to his social media to Christian Music Association, behind the mic with Nash, all the stuff this guy still has going on 34 years later. Um, we're going to try to get all of that into the description. <laughs> Hopefully YouTube gives us uh, enough space for all of this. I was going to say, I hope you don't run out of letter space down there. The bottom, <laughs> yeah, because right? we have to promote ourselves too, Jim. Leave Absolutely. some space for us. <laughs> yeah, and I would be too, man. I'm definitely, uh, I'm definitely promote you guys. And I, and I appreciate you, ta you, you uh, letting me tell my story. I love to tell my story, you know, but it's a lot of people are just uh, – a lot of people like to hear it, you know, and, and, and I appreciate that and thankful that I'm still in this business for after 34 years and butting heads with the Nashville cats and telling them no, but well, I mean, would, I'm, would this go around, um, on this show, like I said before, we, we did over 400 episodes between like 2016 and 2019, then I got wow. out of it. But this time 
Um, even though I had quit and stopped doing it, I was making a list of people. If I ever come back, I'm going to talk to these <laughs> folks. And Jim Nash was on that list, as, as well as like Cliff Doyle and, and a bunch of other people from behind the Cliff scenes. Doyle. I love Cliff as well. Um, but yeah, oh, yeah, I wanted to talk to folks that had a lot to do with the with the success of things that people don't necessarily know um, were behind right. the success of things, like yourself, like okay. Cliff, like songwriters, uh, like Bernie Nelson, for example, like people, right. you know, that <laughs> may not know their name because uh, they're the writer or they're the radio guy or they're the the. PR guy or whatever, right. the people behind yeah. the curtain. So I'm focusing a lot more on that this time than I did before, where before it was more, you know, the artist most of the time. And we're still doing right. those two, you know. We're still talking to folks like Ken Fo and John Stork is coming on soon. I see his sticker back there behind you. Oh, yeah. And, um, yeah, but, we, uh, we're, we're going to be getting rid of that. That door is going to get painted because we're revamping the whole building and stuff. And, and I'm like, okay, so from now on, we're having all the artists uh, here. I'll you, show you, everybody that. Yeah, show. I have an idea for you, too. So there you go, folks. That's the door. So here's what off. you should do, right, Jim? What's that? Here's what you do. You take that door, right, and you auction it off for charity. And then it's going to take hey it's going to take about four guys to pick that door up. It's about 2 inches thick. I'm just saying you could auction that off for charity and then just That's replace the door. We could we could, but what we're going to do is we're going to he said we're just going to paint over that and we're getting new stickers from everybody that's coming in now. We're going to Oh man, now I'm going to have to come up with a sticker. All right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I got a couple yeah, of questions left when these we came here, Well, when we came here um Alan wanted to reposition the station totally something different because it used to be Kicker 106. And he wanted to use the call letters, uh, KTKO, and he wanted to call it Knockout. And I go, well, if we're going to play Texas music, I said, well, we call the Texas Knockout. And he goes, I like that. Let's do that. So we started calling it Texas Knockout uh, 105.7. So all of the anything that had to do with Kicker 106, he's trying to, Ah, push it back out the door and start I got fresh. You. Yeah, and I, I got get you. that. That's that cool. makes sense. Yeah, it definitely makes sense. I see Jeff Jacobs back there, too. I know Jeff Jacobs as well. Yeah. yeah. Season yeah. Ammons, yeah. Natalie yeah. Rose. I see a lot of friends over there. Let's go. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of them on there that I still know that, that still play music, but there's a bunch of them on there that, that, that I've don't not anymore. heard from in a long time. Yeah. I see his Six Sanchez on there. I haven't seen much from him lately. Me either. That's one of them. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's cool. So a couple of really tough questions for you because you're really going to have to think hard on this one or these okay. two. I have two, and this will kind of wrap us up. Um, first one is you have a very unique perspective for this question, so it's going to be interesting to hear your answer. Who is okay. on your Mount Rushmore of Texas Red Dirt artists? Whoa, man. Damn, Chris. <laughs> Man, I have not ever thought about that. Um, well, I got. I would have to say, um, and people will give me flack for saying Jerry Jeff Walker because he's not from Texas, but hell, he 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 started this stuff down here too. Willie Nelson, right off the bat. Waylon Jennings. Um. Probably Johnny Bush, Ooh. and um, oh man, I have to have four in this one little over here with one face on there. But <laughs> you get four great. names, four names, Jim. That's four it. Four names. <laughs> All right, so I got three of them so far. Let me see. My fourth one would probably be um, Bob Childers. Ooh. Wow. Yeah. Bob Childers is one of the guys that really cranked up the red dirt scene. So, yeah, it would be Bob Childers, Willie Nelson, Waylon Jennings, and Johnny Bush. There you go. The Texas red dirt Mount Rushmore of <laughs> Jim Nash. And last question. Yeah, I can't wait to post that because people are going to want to know what you think on that. I can't wait. People are going to yeah. be like, wait, what about this? What about that? You're going to get some flack exactly. for sure. Everybody's got their own, you know? Yep. Yep. 
Yeah, I asked that to Brandon Ryder recently, and he tried to sneak five in there, and I wouldn't let him. <laughs> <laughs> and Guy Clark was the one that did not make the list, right? He had to oh, kick yeah, Guy off. Yeah. So, yeah. funny that we mentioned Guy. So, last question, and I, I usually ask this like a, a, a professional wrestler, and that is, who do you think you are? And who is Jim Nash? Oh, wow. Um, Jim Nash is a guy that is passionate about the Texas Red Dirt music. Passionate about entertaining people. I like to entertain people. Um, I've never, ever been shy on stage. My very first stage intro was in front of 75,000 people, and I got to introduce Chris LaDuke in Oklahoma City. Wow. Um, I'm not scared of it. Um, but I'm a passionate guy for the Texas Red Dirt scene. I love radio. I love the business. Um, it don't always love me back, but I love it anyway. <laughs> and um, and a family man. I love my family, you know, and I do anything in the world. And, and I mean, I would go out and deliver pizzas if it meant I was going to get to support my family. Love it, man. Jim, thank you so much for your time today. Absolutely, brother. Anytime, man. I'm so excited for everything that you have going on, and I'm, I'm going to be a, a loyal listener to Behind the Mic for sure. Uh, maybe I'll learn some things uh, about podcasting from you. You just never know. Yeah, the new, uh, the new episode is going to be uh, it's going to be a three parter. Um, on my last Ranch Roadhouse that I had at the Rocket Cafe, it was a three hour show, and I had. Uh, Daryl Dodd, Gary P. Nunn, Jamie Richards, and Jody Booth on it and for three hours, song swapping. And we got it all recorded. And wow. That's, yeah, I'm going in and I'm uh, trying to edit that down to where I could. And the, the first part one is like right at an hour long, but it's all music and, and talking about music and stuff. So it's pretty entertaining. But I'm going to do that for the next three episodes. Man, that's good stuff. You guys need to check yeah. that out. It's going to be in the description below. The one and only Texas legend, I will use that again, <laughs> Jim Nash. Y'all, please check him out if you haven't heard of Jim yet. He's got so much going on. Such a busy guy, a very knowledgeable guy within the scene. Um, Y'all check him out. And again, Jim, thanks for coming on. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me, buddy. Hey, everybody. This is Brandon Ryder, and you're tuning in to the Boston Chris Show. It's time to check.